I'm good. Good, good, good. How's my room doing? Good. Good. All around. Topic prep assignment is still locked. Good to know. This is the time of the semester when everything feels overwhelming. Da -da 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 Oh, there it is. <laughs> Topic prep should be available now. Um, I guess do that at your leisure. Uh, I told you I'd leave some time to review if you want to do that to start us off. Uh, maybe you got a chance to look at the study guide so far. We do have our exam on Tuesday. I've not posted any sample questions yet, but there's some thought questions on the study guide anyway. So I pretty much look at this and back at my lectures when I'm making the uh, making the exam. Are all the PowerPoints posted? Um, so everything, I think so. Has anybody seen a topic prep missing? Or I'm sorry, a, a PowerPoint? Is it tough having this one big block for everything that shows up on unit two? I could break it down by week if that'd be easier. A little better. It's a little confusing. All right, fair enough. Yeah, so it should be, the stuff for the exam should be contained with within unit two. So we got up through, uh, for this first exam, we got up through the end of vegetative growth. Uh, I did change the topic preps. They should. Um, I guess I, I did that to make all the topic preps count equally. Sometimes I don't come up with enough questions to make 10 points of questions. So I have some that are uh, a little extra short. They're like three questions. They're still worth 10 points. I think your score ends up being a, just proportionally that amount out of 10 points. So if it was a three point topic prep, um, then you get two out of three, you should get 67% or 6.7 points out of 10. Uh, all the topic preps, I'm, I really leave them up there and I think you can retake them to your heart's content. Maybe, I don't know, Canvas. Canvas has this decentralized policy where I have to go in and change the format for every quiz. And if I miss one, I get one in the wrong format. Or We pointed out today, as Tom pointed out, Sometimes I forget to unlock something and then we're based not seeing it. So uh, the goal is for you to be able to retake really any of your topic preps, especially this semester when everybody's got crazy stuff going on. You can go back and redo things to get a better grade. You can ask me for help if you don't know what I'm looking for for the right answer. I am giving you a pathway to much higher grades than people might normally get. Uh, as long as you check in with me, I guess, about those. Okay, I will uh, I'll look at that. It might be that I changed them after the fact and that messed up some kind of algorithm. Uh-huh. Okay. All right, I will have to look at that. Canvas hates capital letters. Uh, yeah, Canvas in, in moving from 
It might be the new quiz format on Canvas, or it might just be a switch from D2L. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, you shouldn't be missing points for capitalization, but I have to go through and change those and, yeah. There's a lot of content out there and I'm usually busy making new content and not fixing old content, but everything you let me know, I do get back and address those. So if, you, if you're getting penalized for something and you don't think you should be, I can fix these things, you just have to let me know, and I, I don't always, I'm not always checking everything the same way that you are. All right, any study questions? Did you get a chance to look at the study guide? I know, you guys work from like, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., right? Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know if I'll ever recover from having less time in the last two weeks. All right, what components make up a pollen grain and an ovule? How do these relate to the life cycle stages? Woo, okay. All right. Pollen and ovules and the life cycle of plants. We can do that. Okay, so <clears throat> when we introduced land plants, Okay, we introduced land plants and talked about the alternation of generations life cycle, multicellular sporophyte, multicellular gametophyte, the processes of meiosis and fertilization as these uh, breakpoints in the diploid or haploid versions of so, I guess I skipped a little bit here. So, zygote and embryo leading up to sporophyte. So, in the seed plants, Uh, the seed plants, the gymnosperms, and the flowering plants, the 
multicellular diploid sporophyte is most of what we see, most of what you know for the life cycle. And um, so based on what we've seen in the other land plants, there's this process of meiosis that produces spores. Talk about spores in the flowering plants, but they're technically there. So in a pollen grain, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so I can draw more of what's in there. So the, the male part of a flower or a male cone on a gymnosperm has uh, specific areas that are devoted to doing meiosis and generating um, what really should be spores. But we don't call them spores because really what, what they contain is more than the spores of something like a moss. So inside of the pollen grain is the other parts of the haploid phase of the life cycle. Uh, gametophyte and gamete are contained in there. Treating my microphone right, keep dragging it on the floor. All right. Uh, maybe a way to envision that is the germination of pollen grains. So pollen grains are uh, compact and they have a thick wall that protects them. And when they have reached their destination, then they germinate and this pollen tube comes out. And part of that pollen tube, so the pollen tube is uh, sort of just barely multicellular, but it's haploid and the part of it that's not the sperm nuclei, that would be like a haploid part that's its own phase of the life cycle. Uh, in the flowering plants, the sperm are not their own cells, they're just designated nuclei that stay inside of this pollen tube. They, they count as sperm, and when sperm nuclei fuse with egg nuclei, that counts as fertilization. So, I guess I, I like to ask this question. I, I think it's neat to kind of know that there's a lot more going on in a pollen grain than just, just a few cell nuclei inside of a, a pollen grain. It's like, whole whole universe of other parts of the life cycle just smooshed down into this little bitty phase. So if we compare this to the mosses, the mosses, uh, the green part of a moss is a gametophyte. And it lives most of its life as that gametophyte. And as uh, land plants evolved, as the flowering and the seed plants came along, the investment in the gametophyte phase just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So now we're left with a spore that contains a gametophyte that basically contains uh, gametes. And a similar thing happens in the ovules. So for each ovule, there's a meiosis. And one of those ovules has the look of
So it's a variety of cells. There's some variation, but a uh, common form is to have these um, seven cells. There's like three cells on each side, and then this larger central cell, and a variety of nuclei. So again, there's like one dedicated gamete. That's the, really the egg nucleus here. So the egg nucleus is the gamete, the other parts that are inside of the four wall. Technically, it's not much of a wall here because the ovule is contained within the ovary, so it doesn't really need protection. It's sort of protected already from the ovary. Uh, the flowering plants, anyway. So there's technically a wall there, and then there's the gametophyte would be these other nuclei. And so, as we saw, uh, when these sperm nuclei, one of them makes it over finally to the egg. That gives us fertilization. So we still have these parts of the life cycle, uh, the sperm and the egg, but the egg is contained within the gametophyte, within the spore wall, and the sperm nucleus is contained really within the gametophyte, which grows out of the spore wall. And then after fertilization, so that one cell is the zygote, uh, that grows up and differentiates into the Embryo. That's really the, the cells that are resulting or descendant from the fertilization event become the embryo. That's the diploid phase that embryo grows up into the plant. That will be able to make new flowers and so on. And then in a lot of flowering plants, we saw that the uh, food for the embryo, which is an important part of the seed, is triploid. How do we get triploid cells? Linda. Polar nuclei, yeah. Great, right. Uh, let me just repeat that for the people who are listening on microphone. Um, so the, there's an extra sperm nucleus. That was the process of double fertilization where this other sperm nucleus fuses with these nuclei in the center of the ovule. And that uh, creates a triploid, a 3N nucleus, and that can grow up to become this endosperm. Yeah, and now your question. Uh-huh. So it's eight nuclei and seven cells. So I've drawn lines around the cells. There are one, two, three cells at the bottom. Each of those have one nucleus. Three cells at the top, those each have one nucleus. So that's six nuclei and six cells. But this central, that counts as a cell also. And it has two nuclei together in that one cell. So 
So I guess I'd like to ask this question. It kind of brings us around, once we've talked about all the ins and outs of flowering plants and seed plants, comes us back to around to the life cycles that were one of the first things we talked about. All right, what happens between pollination and fertilization? Um, I guess a little bit more of this between pollination and fertilization. Um, we like to emphasize that they're not the same thing. So we saw some cases where uh, pollination does not lead to fertilization. So the process of pollination, that is completed when pollen grains make it to the stigma. But their target, the target of the sperm nucleus is down here at an ovule. So for this to be successful, uh, this is one, one of the places where that gametophyte pollen tube really helps out. So the pollen grain might be pretty bulky. And as with other plant tissues, it, it can't really move on its own. So the pollen grain is stuck there, but the pollen tube can grow. So it grows and actually penetrates female tissue down through the style finding its way toward an ovule. Uh, so that, that has to happen. That depends on some cooperation. There's sort of a cooperative signal. Uh, the, the pistil, the female part of the flower, actually provides some nutrients to support that. But it's also possible, as we saw, uh, if you remember, we had um, self-incompatibility as a potential issue. And uh, that was, if you get a pollen grain in a species that has self-incompatibility, if the pollen grain is genetically like the ovule parent, then they recognize each other and the ovule parent prevents the pollen grain from growing. So it's pretty... There's a lot of plants that do self-incompatibility. It's important to think about. Uh, if you're ever trying to cross two plants, you just can't get them to make seeds together. This could be one of the reasons. And probably one of the better examples of why pollination doesn't always lead to fertilization. So the term there, self-incompatibility, refers to pollen from the same flower. That would definitely be self-pollination. Um, but the term also includes individuals that are genetically similar. So they have like a, a gene that's a little flag and says, this is my kind of pollen grain. And if uh, the gene on the pollen grain is the same as the gene on the ovule parent, then the pollen tube does not grow through and this doesn't lead to fertilization. All right, so the answer is there. What usually happens or what happens when uh, fertilization, fertilization does happen is that this pollen tube grows out. Uh, it can be prevented from doing that through the process of self-fertilization. Uh, next question, difference between outcrossing and self-fertilization. Uh, all right. So those are uh, kind of extreme examples, extreme ends of the spectrum of uh, outcrossing.
So we saw this as a spectrum. And plants fall anywhere on this line. So we saw some extreme examples of like closed flowers. or answers that are produced right next to the stigma. If you had a flower where the pollen was produced right next to where pollen is collected, uh, in some cases, this is, this is what a plant benefits from. So if there's not a lot of opportunity to cross with other individuals in the population, this is a way to ensure that seeds are made. Uh, the far other end of the spectrum, I would put unisexual flowers. On separate plants. So you can have uh, basically maybe the familiar animal example, male plants and female plants. So in this case, the only way that pollination can happen is from one plant to an entirely different plant. So what were the benefits of these? Or costs, what is the benefit of selfing? You can be all by yourself. Okay. Right, so benefit, no partner needed. Uh, there's a whole there's a whole literature about the relative advantages of reproductive strategies on islands. Uh, one idea is that if you are a plant and you have dispersed to a new island, maybe you're the only one of your species who made it there. You're really out of luck if you can't get a reproductive partner. So why not reproduce with yourself? Uh, there's also potentially, though, a drawback. Any problems with reproducing with yourself? If not what? No diversity. Right, so... Uh, so sexual reproduction really came around because it does great things for uh, genetic diversity, biological variation. And selfing is an extreme form of inbreeding. So uh, inbreeding, the, the, the potential negative effects of inbreeding are if you have, uh, say, recessive alleles or problematic alleles, if you are inbreeding, you increase the chance that those 
this is negative alleles get combined together. Uh, if you if you did need some variation, this is not a good way to get it. At least not after a few generations. Uh, I guess kind of this can be beneficial long term. So there are plants that do reproduce by selfing a lot. Uh, if they have kind of streamlined their genome so that there are not so many of those negative mutations, they can get by with this for a while. So if they are well adapted to their environment, they don't have a lot of environmental surprises that they need to adapt to. Rid of their negative genetic load. Then this can be beneficial. So it's kind of a just a broader biological pattern. So um, again, relative advantages. There are organisms that get away with selfing. There are organisms that need to do outcrossing. So if we take the benefits and the drawbacks of selfing, we can just basically flip those for extreme outcrossing. So outcrossing allows you to increase your genetic diversity. Everybody who's mating at least comes in from a different diploid starting point. Drawbacks are if you are a unisexual plant and you don't have anyone to mate with, that completely ruins your chances to make any seeds. So kind of in the middle of this, we saw some examples of asexual reproduction as well. Um, so depending on, we saw some more extreme examples where plants can actually produce asexual propagules, units of the plant that can go out and disperse and start new plants. Uh, all the way down to a little more conventional, conventional asexual reproduction where a plant might just reproduce using rhizomes underground. But these allow, uh, I guess also no partner needed, increase the population size Um, this step would basically remove potential inbreeding effects. Inbreeding happens when you're making a new genetic combination that ends up being problematic. But if you're copying an existing genetic combination, then however well adapted the parent plant is, that should pretty well be the level of adaptation in the, the other plants that are made by that plant asexually. But uh, making identical copies also is a relatively low genetic diversity. And then maybe kind of kicking the can down the road for inbreeding. 
So if you have one plant, and it makes a bunch of copies of itself, then you might end up with a big population of plants that uh, maybe they do have a little bit of flowering, then they are a population of uh, basically a separate individuals that are effectively self-pollinating because they're all genetically the same. Future, future inbreeding. Now, this is, I don't know, this is one of the things that I, I find interesting, worth learning more about for plants. Um, kind of the interplay with this vegetative or asexual reproduction combined with something like self-incompatibility is a really nice way to get yourself out of this trouble. So uh, if you are a population that is cloning itself through asexual reproduction, then self-incompatibility would prevent those individuals from mating with each other Maybe you have a population where there are, uh, say, clusters of a few starter individuals that have different, different genetics. Then uh, self-incompatibility would allow crossing to happen between the genetic types, but not within a genetic type. And make sure that, basically make sure that the seeds are worth it and not quite as subject to inbreeding. All right, next question on, I don't know, any questions on reproduction before we move on? Uh, next question on ion exchange. So not iron exchange, but ion exchange. So uh, ion exchange happens because there can be minerals in the soil that are kind of stuck there. Um, so they're basically electrostatic forces that cause them to, uh, these positively charged ions, to be attracted and stuck, kind of locked up in soil particles. So if you put this soil particle into water, it's not just going to dissolve out calcium, magnesium ions, other positively charged ions. But the roots can uh, exude, can produce so hydrogen ions, a little, maybe a little easier to get, potassium ions potentially, other trade, um, Maybe we'll think about the hydrogen ions, keep it simple. So hydrogen ions in solution, those are basically acidifying the environment. And they basically just are able to trade or coax out these positively charged ions from the soil particles. 
So by making the soil environment uh, with these positively charged ions or more acidic, then right, draw these a little bit better. And um, that can allow these other particles to come loose from the soil particles. And these are the so the plants are really needing. So something like hydrogen is a little bit easier to come by for the plants. They can get that through photosynthesis. But they really need their certain ions. And um, that's a, a common feature. Fungi also are able to basically acidify their environments and draw out the nutrients. So uh, rocks are made out of some of these important uh, elements that are useful for biological organisms, but they're not super useful as a rock. You gotta have the right tricks to get them out. Good question, all right. Okay, so we had uh, basically reproductive development, so switching from vegetative to reproductive growth, uh, producing, producing flowers. So I think for a lot of you, probably the structure of a flower is pretty familiar. So different floral organs, these would count as reproductive organs. We've seen how they play out as um, producing pollen grains, producing ovules. I guess I didn't emphasize too much micro gametophyte, mega gametophyte. So micro and mega, small and big. Small are the male components and the mega are the big female components. So the micro gametophyte, uh, that's another way to refer to the Gametophyte that belongs to the pollen grain. Mega gametophyte, the gametophyte that belongs to the ovule. Uh, pollen tube, different nuclei contained in the pollen tube. So these are two kinds of nuclei in a pollen tube. Uh, polar nuclei are found in the ovule. Cell fertilization. Uh, talked about. Pollination, reproductive strategies, seed components. Seed germination. Water relationships. And then a bunch of uh, Fungal terms to round it out. So, last topic on fungi. Mm hmm. How does the food source inside a seed differ? Uh, as they're developing into seeds. So the question, we're, we're asking this question here, um, basically following fertilization, the So there's some relative size differences between the flower and the fruit. Uh, 
I don't remember if we had much chance to look at in a flower. If you get a flower and you look at the ovules, they're typically small, small and white and delicate. And they don't look a lot like seeds at that point. They have the right position to be seeds, but they don't really look like seeds. Uh, after fertilization, so big on this one. So we're making a citrus root. So just a uh, big picture, I like to have people think about this transition between flower and fruit. Uh, we talked about pollination as different from seed dispersal, so different emphases, different phases of the life cycle. And also a rather involved process of going from flower to fruit. So the flower serves the function of the flower, which is to help in pollination. So uh, produces pollen, produces ovules, produces attractants and rewards to get animals involved, if that's the case. But moving forward, once fertilization happens, there's no need for pollination anymore. And the, the goals shift. So this fruit needs to be protected. The seeds need to be provisioned. So let's say, uh, so our new goals here. We'll say just pollination is the goal for the flower. Uh, and the fruit, the goals are uh, protect the seeds. Provision the seeds or provide them with nutrients, right? So if, uh, depending on where the seed ends up, some plants have seeds that have quite a few nutrients inside, uh, depending on what that embryo is going to need after germination to establish the new plant. You're going to have seeds with quite a bit of energy nutrients in there. And as we saw, it's also possible to have animal seed dispersers. So fruits, uh, what you typically think of for a fruit is a fleshy, tasty thing. In a natural setting, that would be fleshy and tasty in order to entice an animal to come eat it or carry it somewhere and allow your seeds to move on. So basically moving from uh, flower to fruit involves investing in structures that help the next phase to succeed. And where does the energy come from that? This is, uh, I guess I'll just put it in the middle here. So energy. So one of the one of the costs of being female. So the flower that is the ovule parent becomes the flower that makes the fruit. So that plant has to invest nutrients in here. So plants that have both male and female function, then all plants have the ability to make this investment. Uh, if you have differences in like separate male and female plants, you might see a big difference in uh, male pr plants producing a whole lot of pollen because they, they might have a little extra energy for not having to invest in this step. And the female plants are a little more limited. So uh, I had a question on the study guide. Why is there so much more pollen than ovules? That's kind of related to this one. So 
producing pollen is relatively cheap compared to producing ovules. Uh, the ovules themselves are larger, but then successful fertilization results in another investment. Got to raise those kids and put them out on their own. <laughs> I like drawing pictures too. We have a whole class on that. All right, sounds like our questions are winding down, possibly. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, right, so physical pressure as a water moving force. Right, so we saw uh, gravity is kind of the one the plants have to overcome. Uh, physical pressure in plants is more of a, I guess th these are all connected, which is why we have that water potential, uh, the, the metric you can, you can quantify, you can put a number on water potential. So we saw an example basically where osmotic pressure can become physical pressure. So. Physical pressure as far as like water that's trying to burst out of its container. If you have, uh, and we saw that as, as this root pressure. So a reason that, reason that water moves up the first little bit of a stem. Try to simplify this a little bit. Maybe you never thought you'd see osmosis again. So this is a really nice use of osmosis. So the insides of cells are uh, I don't know, I usually I like to call them just salty or, or sugary. They have a high concentration of ions, dissolved minerals and dissolved all kinds of other stuff. And if you take uh, rainwater, for example, it's pretty low on having anything dissolved in it. The water had to evaporate to get up in the clouds and evaporated water doesn't take salts with it. So relative to the inside of a root, the water in the soil uh, has less, is less salty. Drawn into these cells across the membrane, that's that thing you covered in osmosis back in introductory biology. So as long as there's water in the soil and a root that's not too watery, and the water moves in there and it has, it's gonna be drawn towards where these salty cells are. Once these fill up, uh, sort of ex reaching the boundaries of those cells. And so the water is basically just from a cumulative effect kind of pushed up in from the roots that are underground and actually pushed up to at least a little ways above ground. So osmotic pressure, physical pressure, these are the forces that are mostly at play in the root system.
So water transport in the overall plant is basically a push-pull. There's a little bit of push from below. And then once we look at the above ground part of the plant, Uh, the water has a destination in the roots of the plant. And if this whole plant is juicy, there's a little bit of pressure that drives the water up from underground. And then the rest of the forces are basically pulling from the leaves. So when evaporation happens or transpiration happens, the water is leaving the leaves and uh, water molecules are sticky for each other. So as, as water is Move replaced by other water behind it. Basically pulls those water molecules up. And that process combined with the, the shapes of the water conducting cells and their uh, features of not allowing air bubbles to form and so on, those allow the stems of even large trees to basically hold on to that water and allow it to keep moving up the trunk of the tree. Well, let me finish my list here. Uh, so gravity, physical pressure, osmotic pressure, um, and then cohesion, water sticking to water, adhesion, water sticking to cell walls and other surfaces. And I think we can count transpiration as a force that basically drives water out of the leaves. So uh, sometimes it's, it's referred to as a more comprehensive term, evapotranspiration. That's sort of a evaporation, transpiration. Transpiration, the trans part refers to moving basically from the inside of the leaf toward the outside of the leaf. 